role of Southeast European countries in the new security rearrangements in, in Europe. Uh, furthermore, what are the implications of EU's so-called geopolitical reawakening, if we can call it like that? Um, and will Romania and Poland, for example, have a decisive role uh, in the EU security uh, reconfigurations and decision making? So these are some of the questions that we'll, uh, we'll be uh, in that, uh, discussing here. So now let me introduce um, our keynote speakers. So first of all, Claudia Visa um, is a Jean Monnet Chair and Professor of Political Science at Fulda University of Applied Sciences in Germany. She's also a adjunct professor in political science at the University of Uvascula, Finland and Chair of the Board of Directors of the newly founded Point Alpha Research Institute at Fulda. Her main research interests lie in the comparative study of democracy, political culture and political so sociology in the EU multi-level system. She especially focuses on changes of concepts and institutions, as well as on their related debates and discourses. Hadija Yadic uh, is an assistant professor in the development and international economics at the University of Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She holds a PhD from the Faculty of Economics and Business from the University of Zagreb in the field of education economics. In addition, she is certified in assessment practice by the Claremont Graduate University Assessors Institute with extensive expertise in various domestic and international projects focusing on education, education reform, education strategy and labor market integration in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Janic is currently the director of the international office at the School of Economics and Business of the University of Sarajevo. Finally, Miruna Kudar Rogota is an associate professor in the Department of International Relations and European Integration of National University of Political Science and Public Administration in Bucharest, director of the Center of European Studies and member of the Open EU Debate Network. Her research interests lie in the Europeanization process, Black Sea security, and post conflict reconstruction of the Western Balkans. So uh, let me just uh, briefly say that this, this uh, lineup is, is uh, particularly interesting and, and I, I look forward to the discussion and uh, I will now give each speaker uh, an opening presentation of 20 minutes and then we will open the floor for questions and comments. So Claudia, would you like to start? So everybody was more or less used to, to having peace, to having peace with our 
of weapons, but all this obviously came at the price of being protected um, by the US and by, by NATO. But um, many Germans, and you see that there is a, also a collective disappointment of the German political class and the German political sign, the political class, uh, with the war, believed in change through trade and believed in peace being something like an, like an eternal right, that, that sort of was there. Yeah? Very similar, by the way, to what my students tell me when we discuss European integration, because they won't believe that there is even the chance that the European Union could break the pieces. For them, it's just that, that this is how things stand. And you have sort of a war breaking into this sea. So again, that's a statement, I think, very much from a Western European perspective, but I think for many of the founding member states in the EU, it has been like this. And especially in Germany, um, it can be interpreted like this. Second thesis, um, we have a geopolitical confrontation and we have an ideological confrontation that is at stake here. What do I mean by geopolitical? I'm using this term because I don't have a better term to explain a conflict about territories that concerns ideologies, that concerns economics, that concerns influences of all, of all kinds. And in my view, that, that this is what we have at stake here. So whose influence in which kinds of territories? So um, moreover, um, what one realized, especially in the first days of the war, is that the rationale behind the Russian attack is difficult to grasp from the European. Um, before the war began, we had many discussions uh, about colleagues, and nobody actually believed that the Russians would be attacking, just because it was not reasonable, because they couldn't win anything. Now we see, yes, they can. They can because they are, they are willing to pay a very large price that probably no European state would have been willing to pay in terms of death, in terms of soldiers killed, in terms of material. But this doesn't seem to be a factor that influenced, uh, it's not only Putin, it's also the Russian elites in, in sort of entering into this war. So there is apparently a rationale behind it, and this rationale is apparently both ideological and geopolitical. So it's, it's about a geopolitical hegemony in the sense of having political and military power in what Russia considers, let's, let me express it a bit bluntly, its turf, um, in, in, in the East, beyond the European Union, and uh, in uh, the Eastern parts of the European Union. But it's also an ideological competition. So Russia constructs the distance between a manly and bold and aggressive East or Russia and a weak, gay, generated, degenerated West. And there is this notion of gay Europe that the Russians used. And I think this is something that we shouldn't underestimate how, how much this works and how well this works in the Russian population. And, and the, the few opinion polls that I know speak in favor of a very high support of the war in the Russian population. So it's not only Putin, so it's, it's also the people that are behind Putin in, in this war. And that also means um, that the war opposes liberal democracies in Europe, in the West, and an autocracy in the democracy, which Russia obviously is. Um, we have an autocratic regime that attacks a neighboring state, which in brackets also is the explanation for what Russia does, because those values that are so dear to us, the rule of law, democracy, freedom, human rights, don't count for much in an autocracy, because that's the principle of how an autocracy work. Even if, and um, that's my, my footnote to the discussion that we just had, even if there is a common standpoint of the Russian and Chinese government that dates from February, so three weeks before they began the attack in Ukraine, and um, both the Russian and the Chinese government claim to be democracies. They add that we are democracies, but democracies in our own way. We want to have the, we don't want the West to impose us their idea of democracy. I find this very interesting because I don't know any category that allows either China or Russia to be termed a democracy, but apparently it's very important to claim that label. Okay, so in my political scientist categories, Russia is an autocracy and it attacks the fundamental values of the European Union that are fixed in the treaties of the European Union. Democracy, freedom, the rule of law. Um, it also contradicts the UN Charter. It uh, 
contradicts the rule-based world order that was in development. Um, and I could put this in terms of this is actually a controversy of Hobbes against Kant. Yeah, Kant standing uh, sort of as, an, as a concept of the rational, uh, liberal, rule of law based West. Thank you. And this means that that's my first, fourth point that the war, because of all this, will bring a new order for Europe. Because the EU is forced to become a geopolitical actor now. And, and that is something that the EU refused to do. The EU used to be um, what Ian Manners, I think, quite convincingly termed a normative power, which means the EU was aiming at change through trade, the EU was trying to support democratization, but the EU was not, um, not intervening as a geopolitical actor that much, as for instance the US did, or still does, um, for a long time. Um, and the EU now has to do this because this, this focus on just trade and exchange apparently no longer works. The EU also has to do it because the EU needs to deal with the new membership applications from Moldova, from Ukraine, from Georgia, plus the existing membership applications from the Western Balkan countries. So the EU has to find an answer to, in, in this sort of geopolitical new world order, and that's not easy. Um, for internal and for external reasons. So that point actually is a, is a big point because internally the EU has a rule of law issues that we have also been discussing today with Poland and Hungary, but also, sorry to say this here, with countries such as Romania and Bulgaria because there are issues with corruption in these countries, um, as you know when you look at the transparency national uh, international indices. So there are some unresolved questions in the European Union. Um, and we see that the European Union really has difficulties to impose the rule of law throughout the European Union. Um, and we also see that, I wouldn't call the Commission a, a toothless tiger, but that the Commission really doesn't do what it could do. Um, three weeks ago in Rome, at the conference of the Standing Group on the European Union, we had a keynote speech by Daniel Kellerman, who really like listed like a list of 10 points about here is what the EU Commission didn't do, but could do. And what really shocked me most, and I didn't know that, was that he read out the congratulation emails by Ursula von der Leyen to Viktor Orban after his, his election victory. Uh, like really not being critical, but really saying, my dearest Viktor, I'm so happy that you won the elections and I'm so looking forward to the collaboration with you in the coming years. So this is not what a statement, you will stop uh, this decline of the rule of law should look like, obviously. So we see a very hesitant European Commission, we see a European Parliament that pushes very much, and uh, all in all we see an EU that has a problem to react to these rule of law problems. Um, I know that Ramona, she, she's no longer here, but she mentioned how she discussed this with her students and how it was a question whether the EU obviously should intervene into the rule of law of the member states. Now I'm going to make a very strong point that the EU not only should, but must do this. Why must the EU do this? Because the EU is a community of values. It's in the treaties. Um, if you have a constitution, and the EU treaties are a kind of constitution, then you must adhere to this constitution. And, and it's not just a basis, it's not just something that can be negotiable, but it's sort of the legal basis that needs to be kept. It is also the rules of the game that everybody subscribed to, every country subscribed to when they entered the European Union. It would go in a similar way for Germany or France or Sweden, um, if they had similar problems. So I'm not in any kind uh, only extending this to Eastern Europe. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm really making a claim here. And I think it would endanger the EU internally if they were be, to be too weak in that respect. Um, now, if now just we as the European Union too quickly would say, OK, so let's take in any candidate that is there. And let me just sort of make two points about Ukraine. Um, Ukraine has a massive problem with corruption. And there are also studies saying that uh, democracy in Ukraine is rather receding during the war. Um, of course it is, because it's in a war, because they, they are in, in, in a war time. So you can't expect Ukraine to be a better democracy after the war, like normally, by all instances. And that, to me, speaks against just a philosophy of, okay, let's take every country in that there is, because 
it would really, I think, endanger the rule of law in turn in the European Union. Um, now, this does not mean we must hold, we as the EU or the EU should hold all countries at bay that don't 100% com 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 comply with the rule of law issues. But it means there is a dilemma here so on how, how to deal with that actually and, and what to do with it. And what also the second thing that really struck me, and, and that, to say it bluntly, I don't understand. I don't understand why Ukraine is a candidate when at the same time the Western Balkans are kept on hold and on hold and on hold. It, there's no logic in there. There is really no logic except a kind of populist logic of, okay, now we need to offer something to Ukraine because there's a war in Ukraine when other countries that are in the same situation um, don't get an offer. So very clearly, I think the EU is forced to, to do something about that situation. And that's the, that's the point where I have certain sympathies for this Macronian idea of the European community, European political community, even if he doesn't, he didn't give any flesh to it. He just suggested the idea. Um, he hasn't given this that much content. But I think that indicates a kind of path to go, to create a political community that not necessarily means that everybody has to at once adhere to all the rules of the EU's rule of law and the acquis communautaire. So the, for me, that would be the direction to go, um, because we don't win anything when we endanger the EU internally. Third point, externally, we see an EU that buys weapons. Okay, so Never happened, never seen. It's not even something that is really foreseen in the treaties, and nevertheless, the EU, European Union, bought weapons and sent them to Ukraine. So, very clearly, he's, we see a European Union that even wants to become a military actor, which is like really, really strange. And um, I'm not sure if the tendency in the EU is that clear. I, I would say Josef Borrell and Ursula von der Leyen are very much uh, pushing this. But I'm not sure how much unanimity there is in the European Council, actually, on that development. But I'm, I'm sure, and I really want to underline, that the EU must position itself in, 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 in all this, because the, the world order doesn't give any choice. So the politics that worked so far, more or less, and that, that were mostly trade-based, I, I, I think very clearly have come to an end. And, and my point mainly is that I don't see the, the answer the EU has to all this. They, they, people have realized, and leaders, EU leaders have realized that they have to do this, but the, the how, the why, the rationals behind it, and the, the means um, are yet to be defined. So the EU has to position itself in the new geopolitical and ideological world order. Well, <laughs> okay. That is uh, sort of what I mean by this paradigm change towards a geopolitical Europe. From normative power, from peaceful interventions, democracy promotion and change through trade, from being an economic but not political or military world power, from being in a useful symbiosis with NATO, so NATO doing the dirty job about the weapons and the military and the EU doing the nice things about democracy promotion and trade, and Erasmus, not to forget, to a <laughs> geopolitical EU with von der Leyen and Borrell. Yeah, in a way, in a way, the European Union is losing its innocence at the moment. I think, I guess, this is what I'm trying to say. And, and by the way, Germany is also losing its innocence in a in a in a, in a swiftness that I nobody would have suspected could be possible four months ago. So, all this is because we live in a multipolar world order, or even a multi-order world order, geopolitically, economically, ideologically, and legally. And I think it's, this is really something that we have to dwell on, even if we are not international relations scholars. If you look at the countries that did not vote on the red resolution that condemns the Russian aggression in Ukraine, you see a lot of intermediary powers in the world. It's not only China, it's also India, it's Brazil. So it's a lot of developing powers. Um, and so you see that there are different positions and alliances in the world. It's clear that China cooperates with Russia and they intend to continue cooperating with Russia. Um, they are just not taking an open position pro Russia because it's too dangerous. Because they have too much to lose, but they are not, not, not taking a position against Russia either. Yeah. Um, 
you see, as I said, the states that abstain from voting against the Russian invasion in the UN General Assembly, and, and that's a kind of floating candidates. So you are not, it's not sure with whom they will have an alliance. And this is not only a question, like in the classical geopolitical terms, it's not only a question about military alliances, or whose territory are we invading, or what are we talking about. It's a question for economic interventions, and it's also a question for these ideological wars that I was talking about. So liberal democracies against autocracies. Um, and it, this is really something, and that really worries me, that might endanger liberal democracy, not in the long term, but in the mid term, um, if just the, the authoritarian states are more attractive than the liberal democracies. And we should not forget, we must not forget, that there's a presidential election coming in the US in 2024. And it's suffice to say that if Donald Trump were president of the US in the moment, we would be in a very different situation, I think, when it comes to NATO's reaction to the Ukraine war. So I'm really glad um, he is not, and Joe Biden is the president, but this might change in 2024. And clearly, overall, the situation in the US, and that's also something that has been mentioned in the previous panel, is something that is a danger in, in that whole setting, and, and for the European Union. So, the EU is forced to take a position, and here is a list of points that I think that the EU and its member states need to take into account. Um, they need to fix conditions and also limits to EU enlargement for all the reasons that I have been giving. So there must be clear conditions, meaning, okay, if you comply A, B, C, D, E, then you can become a member, and if you don't, you can't. And that would go, let it be very clearly, in my view, for Ukraine as well. So there can be no geopolitical exceptions there. Um, but I, as I, again, I say such a thing as a European political community, I think, would be, would be a good compliment. Um, but the EU should also be very clear and transparent about the goals and means of becoming a geopolitical actor. So to decide whether and how to defend Kant against Hobbes. So what does it actually mean yeah, that, that we, we are more, we as Europeans are usually more in favor of Kant? Um, we need to define as Europeans how to enact the new goals, powers and means. And very completely this means, and, and that is a direct comment to the German debate, um, that it's not enough just to deliver weapons to Ukraine. Because when you listen to many, especially German Greens, who have taken a 180-degree switch from being against weapon delivery to, to be pro-weapon delivery, when you listen to some of them, you have the impression that, okay, let's send all the weapons to the Ukrainians, and those brave Ukrainians will defend democracy for us, we'll still be innocent, and then the war will be over, and all the, the bad guys will be dead, and democracy will be reigning again. And this is not how it's going to go, because if you deliver weapons into a region, obviously you have a role post-war in that region. And you don't see so much public reflection about this, neither in the European Union uh, nor in Germany, to, to, to my great regret. So if we intervene, we as Europeans take on a responsibility in the Ukraine region, and we have to prepare who, what and how is going to shape the post-war order. To make another nasty comment, I have been uh, discussing with one of my colleagues about the Azov Regiment, which is very clearly a right-wing extremist um, group of, of fighters. <laughs> he just, you know, ironically said, well, people that just think that this regiment will go home after the war and said, hey guys, we are over, um, are very much mistaken. Yeah. I, I, that made me think about the post-World War I order in Germany, where we had soldiers that were no longer soldiers, but were anti-democrats and that became revolutionaries against democracy. They, they, they became something that we would nowadays call terrorists. And Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Knecht were the first victims because they were killed, um, and that was after the war. Yeah, so we also risk something like this. And uh, I just want to underline that Europe must not be naive in, in, in this respect. So I think if Europe intervenes somewhere, then it must be to defend Kant, and not just say, okay, well, things will go in a good direction anyway. It's not going to be that simple. So we need to defend democratic values and institutions in an area of influence. And that sounds pretty familiar to what the US did about many decades, if I, if I may say this here. And this is also what I mean by Europe losing its innocence. Yeah, so and at last point, and that's not trivial at all, um, the European Union need to suggest how to shape a new multipolar world order, knowing that it's going to be a multi-ideology world order. 
And this is going to be my very last point, and I don't have an answer to this. There is not even a basis on what the rule of the new world order should be. Um, and if there's not even a basis, it's going to be really difficult to even have peace negotiations because then we don't even know what the basis of these peace negotiations is. And to me, that's really a tremendous challenge. Um, and uh, so I think a lot of uh, real politics, to call this very nice German term, will be needed in the coming years. Yeah. And actually, this is something that we've discussed in this institute. Um, that uh, we, we, we just have been founded. Very, very timely, so we have been planning this one and a half years, and then the war broke out, so we suddenly suddenly working on the hot topics. I would have wished it would be so. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you for this presentation that gave us a very uh, substantial view of uh, the EU's uh, inner uh, politics regarding uh, uh, new situation. So now we give the floor to Hatija from the perspective of a potential candidate country to the EU, and uh, let's hear your views about about this this topic. Please. Thank you. Um, when I was now um, paying really close attention to, to all the state, seven statements, I can see actually, and I can use the Western Balkan countries um, in case study. I'm going through how. EU is missing the point how he is promoting regional cooperation for 15 years and not intervening uh, into s s uh, serious structural reforms and democratization, rule of law, um, decreasing corruption. And uh, now, especially in terms of the Ukrainian uh, war and how Russia is playing a part from Serbia and the Republic of Serbia. So um, let me uh, start. Um, I'll just briefly set the scene. Uh, for for the, 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 the situation with what is going on in the region and definitely focus more on Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and I have divided that specific part uh, into two, I would say, time slots. Just what happened before uh, in the country, before um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and after. How actually um, the, the, the um, the uh, momentum has changed in terms of what was expected what Putin will achieve in Russia and how Serbia actually recognized its potential over there. So um, going back to, to Claudia's comment on how she, how Germans don't know what war is, we actually do a lot personally. So seeing pictures of Ukraine was a like, big, big um, uh, uh, shock for all people in the region, Serbia and Croatia and Bosnians, because that was the, our recent history, 25 years ago. And, and, and the refugees and the migrants and everything was, was a big trigger. So as is in, in, in all the media, the Ukraine war was definitely present in the region. And the war ended in the uh, fully, I would say, sponsored and promoted the Dayton Peace Agreement by the U.S. So I'm putting this here and just saying how the U.S. actually played a major part uh, in, in, in achieving the, the peace in the country and how actually the EU came and the European community came afterwards in terms of the um, financing of development, reconstruction, uh, reconstruction of infrastructure, um, and all the uh, development of, of uh, all countries that were involved in the war. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina is, was definitely out of all of these countries in the region, uh, majorly hit by the war in terms of uh, both uh, human casualties and the uh, uh, infrastructure and everything that would need to be rebuilt completely after the war. And we, if you look at the country itself now and the neighboring countries of the Western Balkans region, besides definitely Croatia, which, has that, which is a member of the European Union since 2013, all countries in the region are in different stages. And for example, North Macedonia got the candidate status on the same day when Croatia got. And now we can see that Croatia is already a member for a long time, while North Macedonia still does not have a date for starting the negotiation process. It, 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 we have to be sincere and say that North Macedonia was very eager to even change the name in order to fulfill the conditions and to get the date, and now we have a Bulgaria blocking the process, process again. 
and uh, uh, all other countries are actually the candidate countries. Some have a date, some have opened uh, some chapters and so on. While Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo are still considered a potential candidate countries, and Kosovo specifically does not all members of the European Union have recognized its independence yet. The country itself is highly complicated, and I say complicated I mean, uh, in terms of the administrative structure and decision-making process, um, which is highly connected with definitely, and I, I can argue for days with the high corruption and um, uh, inefficiency of the, uh, the bureaucratic uh, actually uh, apparatus and, and so on. Um, it is definitely lagging behind its neighbors. Um, in terms of uh, both EU integrations and the structural reforms. And the thing is that I want to discuss with you today, and uh, it, that was quite recent in the last year, what happened is that um, three different uh, ethnic groups live in the country and no political decision can be made without each of them uh, giving their approval. Uh, however, in July, uh, in June of last year, that has changed and the country was blocked for almost a year. Um, and that was highly also connected with the, with the um, uh, later, what actually called later uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian war. How EU played the part after the Dayton Peace Agreement? So the stabilization association process was uh, actually created for the purpose of eventually getting Western Balkans into the EU. And from 2003, then when we signed the agreement in 2008, and so on, different summits, and I don't want to bother with the dates and everything, but they're always saying, we are expecting you, you should fulfill these conditions, and so on, but regional trade is important, regional cooperation is important, and so on. Uh, as a result of the Stabilization Association um, Agreement, we have a free trade, the EU is the, the biggest actually uh, trade partner, not all, all, only of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but major, major of, of all the countries. Um, countries are members of CEFTA, and uh, as a result of the Stability Pact, uh, Regional Cooperation Council was formed um, uh, to, to again stimulate the regional cooperation that the EU was uh, very much uh, focusing on. Um, Generally, when you look at what the EU was expecting from us, um, the, the, uh, the conditions are quite uh, broad. I'm not saying that, they are, that these problems are not existent, definitely. But starting from the market economy, um, so these, these countries were also a part of former socialist uh, Yugoslavia, so state-owned enterprises had to be privatized completely, re-established economic cooperation between the countries that were actually uh, on the opposite sides uh, during the war in 1990s, human rights, minority rights, and cooperation with the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. But it's also, um, the countries are also a playground, I would say, and that was also uh, a, a term mentioned by the Austrian uh, foreign minister just a couple of days ago, saying that Bosnia is going to be the playground for foreign actors. Um, and in that sense, I strongly <laughs> mentioned Russia, China, and Turkey, each of them having different uh, roles and different associates when it comes to the political leaders, um, not only in Bosnia, but in the entire region itself. Um, what, what, what uh, also um, existence in the region is the so-called Berlin process, um, but also another uh, initiative uh, sponsored mainly by Serbia called Open Balkans. Um, it, it used to be called the Schengen, that's um, uh, currently agreed only by Serbia, Albania, and North Macedonia. Some countries in the region have reservations when it comes to uh, joining the Open Balkans since they think it's. Um, Kind of uh, Serbian had, uh, Serbian, Serbia playing a big role again in the region, which they find not really uh, that attractive, especially taking into account the war. So, what was going on in Bosnia just before February, basically? Um, uh, I, 
I, I, I have seen the, uh, the polls from our um, director for European integration, that is on the institution at the state level, and the uh, general disencouragement dis dis with the European Union, uh, the way the European Union behaves towards the uh, Western Balkans, the popularity was uh, strongly decreasing, and so on. Um, and um, we, even though, uh, even having this uh, condition, uh, conditions uh, in 2016, we finally applied, fulfilling the, the questionnaire and uh, applying right for the uh, candidate status. Three years later, um, Brussels outlined 14 different requirements for the country to fulfill, and basically, um, I can say that the dialogue has stopped at that point. Uh, Who is to blame? I would say both the political leaders in the country, but also the lack of, of, of um, proper um, uh, proper um, behavior from the European Union, and not only conditionality that was always focused uh, in the region, uh, even since the, the beginning of ability. ability. <laughs> um, obviously, um, since these were 14 requirements, uh, they are quite quite specific, from implementation of specific laws, uh, reforms, including the constitution, because the Dayton Peace Agreement from 1995 is the constitution, and as such need, needs really uh, deeper, uh, comprehensive reforms, but uh, lack of, definitely lack of political will. As I said, of growing Euro skepticism among, uh, among everyone in the country, but the the trigger uh, last year, in Ju July 2021, 20, uh, was that uh, Valentin Inska, an Austrian um, diplomat who, is, who was at that time serving as a UN High Representative for Bosnia, has imposed a, ban a, a, a law because he has an executive powers in the country banning the denial of genocide. And at the same time, you can see now that the problem was that one side or one, one of the three, three uh, ethnic groups completely withdraw from the state institutions, meaning no political decision was, was, was not able to be made or decided at the state level at any of the, any of the um, institutions, which basically meant a complete blockage of the country for several months that actually followed. Parallel to that, um, the political leaders of the Serbian side were highly um, sponsored and uh, very closely associated with Putin and Lavrov. They are, uh, even Dodik was, uh, uh, Dodik was, uh, it was, was it 10 days ago, 18th of June, when the St. Pet Petersburg Forum uh, was uh, held in Russia, he was the only, the only European leader actually going over there and taking pictures with Putin. Even Lavrov uh, was scheduled to visit Serbia on 6th of June, but then the, the visit was cancelled in the morning because obviously the airspace was closed uh, of major uh, European, European countries. But then Ukraine happened uh, and suddenly the, uh, the talks by the Serbian leaders how Bosnia and Herzegovina is not functioning, does not function because they are blocking it for uh, seven months. Um, it, how they should separate and they should uh, uh, call for a referendum or for independence. Suddenly, um, uh, in the media, in the public space, you could see that they actually there is a slight shift in what they are talking about because now there is no uh, support or not that much support and. Um, uh, I, I, I can argue with the looking at this, the, the things that uh, US, UK and European Union was doing in the last couple of months is that they were imposing sanctions on several political leaders due to um, accusations of, of corruption, so corrupt activities and diminishing order and constitution that was defined in the Dayton uh, peace, peace Agreement. Um, as I already said, uh, uh, it is considered a playground for actors outside Europe uh, um, in terms of sponsoring uh, some politicians, and most of those politicians obviously that are uh, major, from the major ethnic party, parties of three ethnic groups in the country. But um, what is visible in the last couple of months um, 
it seems that Ukraine has to happen in order to uh, at least uh, increase, uh, have some increase in international uh, uh, international engagement in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina when it comes to uh, U.S. and U.K. Um, in uh, so it happened also 10, 10 days ago, political leaders of the country, opposition and the ruling parties were uh, two days in Brussels signing the new, new agreement on the political reforms, again, uh, somehow narrowing those 14, a bit narrowing those 14 requirements that the EU has set uh, as, a, uh, as a prerequisite for getting a candidate status. Uh, what is next? So basically, um, uh, we, we have to be completely sincere and say that the, the success of Dayton um, uh, shows how important is, is good international leadership. And that's something that definitely, uh, not only Bosnia was missing, but I would say entire region in the last years. Um, Claudia was saying uh, how EU was a Having a mild, I would say, mild role, majorly promoting regional cooperation, trade, saying how we have to gather around on the on the basis of common economic economic uh, interests. That's also important because we have to build the the, the, the economy. Com economy has to be competitive once the country enters a single European market. But there are some other things that are quite quite. Uh, quite an important, uh, quite big problem actually in the region, including corruption and, and uh, lack of rule of law. What is going on? In, in what will happen in, in fall? Uh, we have general elections. There is always a, an interesting um, experience. Um, there is a UN Security Council session on Bosnia and in November, and. Um, Russia is a member of uh, Peace Implementation Council, uh, and Russia is always blocking any further uh, involvement and exp extension of the mandate of the UN uh, High Representative. So we are basically ex ex expecting again um, their veto on this. June 12th was the meeting with uh, Charles Michel, the political leaders, and the implementation of this new agreement is ex expected after the. the um, the government uh, is hopefully going to be formed after the elections. And um, I, at the end, I can only say that uh, we can discuss this further, that Bosnia also needs a strong reformation of its European future. And uh, there is a, a lot, the day when the uh, Ukraine and Moldova got the candidate status, the uh, media was quite divided, and, and the politicians were also quite divided in what, what should be done with, when it comes to our candidate status. Those in power, the, they, were, they were saying, this is not possible, you know, we should have this, uh, we should have received the candidate status finally. Um, because that would be also at some point reaffirmation of that they, are, they were doing a good job, which they were not, obviously. Um, while the opposition was saying, oh, thank God we didn't, because the, 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 the leaders from the ruling parties were being such, somehow you know, awarded for the work that they have actually done. So um, we are not, uh, definitely we are not talking about having all the countries in the European Union prior and without uh, further and uh, comprehensive structural and economic and political reforms, but EU needs to um, make a shift in its, um, in its uh, approach towards uh, Western Balkans. Thank you.
because I'd like to, to include and to reflect a bit of uh, what our guests uh, also mentioned. Um, I think uh, the ones of you at least uh, that are on the morning here, you have seen uh, some graphs, you have seen numbers, you have seen now uh, very uh, well-structured arguments. Uh, and I think it's time for me to remind myself that, that I'm a writer. Uh, that I'm a storyteller and that uh, numbers are important uh, if you put next to them also meanings and stories. Um, so I feel the need now to connect the dots a little bit uh, and to put some storytelling between some numbers that I find relevant and to connect uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina story uh, because this is a country very dear for me. It is the country where I uh, did my PhD research and uh, of course I'm uh, at my base as an expert in Western Balkans and in Bosnia. And I find it very relevant for unpacking Europe's role, uh, both in the Balkans and in the Eastern Partnership countries. Um, and I feel the need to connect the dots with what is going on in Bosnia, with what is going on in Ukraine and with Romania. So um, these will be the three main uh, stops. What, uh, what connects um, both uh, the dramas and um, the solutions, definitely, um, for the three countries. So I wanted to share with you some numbers uh, that are not, uh, that might seem to seem empty of meaning, but, but definitely I want to reflect together um, uh, to them. So, uh, Three, uh, 13,000, this is the first number. Uh, 13,000 Jews uh, were killed in around three days between 27th of June and 29th of June, uh, 1941, in Yash, a Romanian city in uh, Moldova. Um, so today we are actually commemorating this uh, massacre uh, from Yash called the Pogrom in Yash, where historians are still uh, discussing numbers, but I think uh, 13,000 more or less is not important. Uh, but what is important is that now Romanian historiography is divided. Uh, definitely, innocent people were killed in June 1941 in Romania, like in other parts of Europe. Um, and we are discussing today in 2022, watching uh, on TV other innocent people being killed, uh, still about numbers, still about whether to intervene or not, are weapons most efficient, who should actually uh, intervene, and all these you know, hard geopolitical military questions. Um, but the fact that in 2022 we have a part of the Romanian population and some very respectable intellectuals and historians, <laughs> and unfortunately one of them is my father, that question not only the number of Jews being killed, but also whether Romanian authorities had any responsibility in that, because you know we were occupied at that moment, um, it all becomes um, a sort of competition for um, the other to be blamed, which is in a way uh, very shameful, I would say. Of course, for me, it's, it's a, a personal thing, because I have hope that my students will never question neither the number of the people, innocent citizens of Yash city that happened to be Jews, um, but neither the responsibility of who did it. Um, and this generational clash that we have in Romania that is very visible and very alive, and not just in my family, I'd say, it's, it's out there in the public discussion, um, struck a special chord for me because it's still very vivid in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Why did we need an OHR to give a law to forbid uh, genocide denial? Well, it's clear because there were still a lot of public figures, politicians, even history books in Republika Srpska denying genocide, denying 
the 8,500 Muslim boys and men that were killed in Srebrenica, denying probably the around 11,000 innocent people in Sarajevo that have been killed during the siege of Sarajevo. Um, this parallelism that I just checked up this morning, 30,000 in just a few days, 11,000 in Sarajevo during the five years of the siege, um, is very strong because again, we don't talk about soldiers. We don't talk about geopolitical agendas or leaders that use more sophisticated weapons to gain influence. We talk about people who were preparing to go to their job the next day. Um, and after 30 years, in the case of Bosnia, there are still people wanting to erase their memory, to question their lives, their lost lives, and to play uh, with genocide denial, as if um, not assuming responsibility for someone that would actually make you feel better. No, it doesn't make you feel better, and I think the way politics looks like in Republika so it's a clear image of how monstrous a regime can become when it tries to um, think in another direction. And going to Ukraine, um, I think all of us have seen the very graphic images of more than 250 people massacred in Bucha, uh, and in many other cities, but I guess Bucha was a um, peak of all that discussion, because again, we talked about people in their houses being massacred, or on the streets, um, not having guns, not being enrolled in the army, um, and um, losing their lives while the whole world is watching, tweaking, maybe even giving some tears and likes or donations. Uh, and we are still asking the same question like in Bosnia. When should we intervene? Is EU uh, powerful enough to intervene? Who should do the first step? It's almost like in a failed date, right? Uh, where, where exactly are the wrong gestures uh, in place? But again, we talk about innocent people, 211,000, 13,000. We anyway don't know the figures in Ukraine. So we cannot play with the right figures at this moment anyway. So in Ukraine, uh, like in Bosnia and Herzegovina, another power denies the country the right to its identity. We heard the story before. Serbia was all the time saying Bosnia has no right to exist because it never existed as a country. Does it sound familiar? It's the exact narrative. Ukraine has no right to its nationality. It doesn't have any right to exist. And when I read these narratives, I think about how the fact that I'm teaching international relations in this moment is one of the most horrible jobs in the world. I would prefer to have any other job. Because when I'm opening the PowerPoint and I'm showing my students maps of the First World War, maps of the Second World War, maps of 2022, what I see and what I have to explain them is a map um, written with hatred, a, a map shaped by hatred and by European values and by everything that was already mentioned. But hatred is there in our maps. Of course, hatred is also in our contested maps. Because whenever I show a map with Kosovo included in Romania, I have all the time to explain to my students that yes, Kosovo is a country, but it's not a country at the same time. Yes, there were innocent people dying in Kosovo, at the same time that there were innocent people dying in Belgrade, walking on the streets of Belgrade in 1999 during the NATO bombings. And uh, teaching these maps of hatred, in a way, takes me to one of the ideas that, again, in my point, connects the dots with the uh, drama of conflict and innocent people dying in Romania in 1941, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992-1995, and right now as we speak in Ukraine. And this is uh, intergenerational trauma. 
um, psychologists define trauma as not the event that happened, but the feeling that you had after an event. And um, when I'm teaching these horrors that we call actually the history of 21st, of 20 and 21st century to my students, I'm all the time, in a way, going to uh, this trauma of the figures and trauma of the present. How to deal with this trauma? How to integrate um, a war that is not played uh, between um, soldiers, a war that does not respect international norms that we are all the time discussing, um, and a new war that Mary Calder famously described. Uh, what is this new war? Um, Soldiers are everywhere. Soldiers are on Twitter, at home, writing on Facebook. Soldiers don't have only physical guns. Uh, soldiers have denial uh, of other people's death. Soldiers have questioning borders and questioning world order. These are the new soldiers of the new war. So in this, um, in a way, a very, very intricate um, uh, situation, what is the role of uh, generational trauma? And I'm talking about it because I have to make peace with me um, trying to accept my father's perspective. He's a historian, he's an intellectual. He says he has arguments, but I'm, I'm in a way very much emotionally struck because today we celebrate this important event in Romania's history that is still not being taught at school. And we are still questioning if it happened or not. And I believe that my generation, um, and Atija's generation in Bosnia, and the new generation of historians and intellectuals in Ukraine, like the writer Serhii Jadan, that is now in Kharkiv fighting for the right of his country to exist, um, are trying to deal with the traumas of our country's past in a totally different way. And this is my hope for my students, and that's why I love my job, actually. Um, because I can help my students uh, see and watch these maps driven by hatred. And I can empower them to envisage a world of foreign policy and diplomacy, either in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Romania or Ukraine, where um, maps of mutual understanding and cooperation um, could be, in a way, um, over uh, just juxtaposed on the maps of hatred. And I would love to discuss all these weird <laughs> ideas uh, with you. Uh, and I want to thank also Hatija and uh, Claudia for inspiring some of these uh, uh, ideas. Thank you. I would have one for uh, Claudia and for Hatija. My name is Raga Shahita. I'm a PhD candidate at the Senate here in Bucharest. Um, Professor Wisner, you mentioned that the EU must reshape or reevaluate its conditionality in the enlargement process. They already uh, went through a, um, a reshape of this process two years ago with the new methodology of enlargement. Uh, do you think that right now, after what happened last week with the clear no said to all of the Balkans and the clear yes given to uh, Ukraine and Moldova, a reshape would be the best message given to all these countries? And if this reshape would be um, implemented, will it affect just future candidates or current candidates or will it affect already um, countries that are already in the process of negotiating their own accession. Because signaling them another uh, 
shape, another need for a reshape. I don't think it's uh, the best message right now. You have done enough, but now we are changing the rules of the game again, just so you fit in the box and tick again all the boxes. Thank you. Okay, so, so maybe you, you, you understood something that I didn't want to say. Um, I didn't want to... I, I wanted the contrary of making a plenary for all boxes to tick. Um, because we see that the boxes to tick don't match. Clearly, if Ukraine would have had to match the same boxes as the Western Balkans, it would not be a candidate. This is very simple. And this is what I mean. Um, what I mean is that if the EU wants to have a political strategy, then it must be a clear political Um, and, and you cannot just pick cherries in the sense of we are picking Ukraine because there is some geopolitical pressing necessity and we are leaving out the Western Balkans because it's a little bit less pressing in the moment, but it might become pressing in 10 years and maybe then in the recent. To me that's absolutely random and that's really cynical, so I'm rather making a, a plenary for a kind of grand strategy and not for more boxes. I, I would really want to see clear decisions. By the way, very much in accordance um, with what uh, the German Chancellor, um, the German Chancellor Scholz, uh, said after this, uh, <laughs> after, after the summit. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss, and uh, I don't see a succinct, overarching strategy of the EU, and I find this very frustrating. Um, and actually, I think I'm, I'm 100% in fit with what, what both of you said, and it really strikes me, and I must mention it here. It really strikes me that we are here from uh, Romania, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and from Germany. I, I think that's really a coincidence because I really must say that I'm from the from the country from which all this violence is originated in the Second World War, uh, which actually very much shaped uh, our history. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really find it striking. And when I'm saying something like this, I'm also saying it against this background that I have always believed in a special responsibility of Germany. Germany was so devastating to peace in Europe. So I think there is a debt that we have to pay back in a sense, which also is something that is debated in Germany like critically. Um, but I, I would make this claim. And I think with this background, uh, and, and, and talking about taking responsibility, it must be one clear strategy. And for me, this strategy must be based on the rule of law. Um, so I wouldn't, how can I say, I wouldn't dissolve the criteria, but I would strengthen the support uh, and the incentives. And, and this is what I mean. You cannot just go to Bosnia and the government and say, hey guys, it would be nice if you did something more against corruption. Oh, you don't. Okay. So then let's meet again next year. Yeah. <laughs> this is just stupid. And, and this is not what the US did when they wanted to build democracies. When the US came to Germany after the Second World War, there were two decisions, and it's probably useful to recollect it here. So there was the Morgenthau plan uh, that really consisted in sort of keeping Germany an agricultural country and keeping the Germans on the trees and on the fields. Um, and when they decided against that, and when the idea of the Marshall plan won, it was a clear re-education strategy that came with it. Yeah, okay, they, they, they didn't stop some, some old Nazis from being um, in, in office, but the majority of the German population was re-educated, like really top down, like in schools, like major education, to become Democrats, and it worked considerably well. Um, so, so very clearly what I'm saying here, and, and many people would criticize me in Germany for being super Europe's planning, West's planning, <laughs> authoritative or whatsoever, and I would just say, so what? You, you want to join a club, this club is a democratic club, so you stick to the rules, here are our conditions, we help you to comply with the conditions. So here is some very concrete help. And if you don't want it well, feel free. And I think that would make up for a very good incentive. Sorry, it has been a bit long, but I think um, it needed some explanation. Yeah, thank you, Barry, for uh, asking this question. Um, just, again, to reaffirm that definitely a more comprehensive approach, an overall comprehensive approach for the alignment. You cannot say to the country, sign the Stabilization Association Agreement, implement it, implement the trade agreement, the trade facilitation agreement that is part, and then come up with the 14 different uh, prerequisites. Do not answer anything, you know, in three or five, four, four years, and then change in the meantime, where you have North Macedonia changing the name, waiting for 
losing basically 10 or more years because I just 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 said that they got the candidate status the same day when Croatia got it and Croatia finished the negotiation process, signed the seat acceding the treaty, is a member since 2013, so almost 10 years, <laughs> nine years. Um, then uh, keep keep the Albania again, uh, Serbia, different part, uh, path and so on. So more comprehensive approach. Uh, and I'm not talking about eliminating the boxes. It's obvious that these countries are facing severe problems with rule of law, corruption. They, we need structural and economic reforms. And there, there's a big issue in Serbia, for example, with freedom of, of media and so on. These things have to be changed. But it's at the same time a more, more comprehensive and clear approach when it comes to the EU's policy, enlargement policy. If I may also, I mean, I don't want to have the stereotype of having all female panel and me bringing emotional arguments. I can do also some real politic analysis, right, to prove myself. No, but I just also wanted to add uh, Romania's role. That it's important to uh, underline something uh, that uh, should be uh, real politic. Yes, Romania affirms through its leaders and its policymakers that is a firm supporter of Western Balkans in the European integration. We even had that as a priority during our presidency in 2019. Uh, well, of course, uh, there are multiple problems. One of them is Kosovo, but yes, we uh, support the entire region and we, we want them uh, there. At the same time, um, we have a much more advanced uh, and proactive um, engagement uh, when it comes to Republic of Moldova. Um, it's for obvious reasons. And I would dare to underline that uh, you could see that Romania, Poland, and other uh, Southeast European countries played a very important role these days in Brussels to uh, get unanimity from countries and chancelleries that were very obviously opposing opening accession uh, negotiations because they are also very openly or more diplom diplomatically opposing opening negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia and uh, the, Westerns, uh, the Western Balkans at large. Uh, so uh, I would say that what we witnessed this week, uh, last week in uh, Brussels was also part of very active diplomacy uh, of the Eastern flank uh, of the European Union which makes me in a way proud of our uh, diplomacy in favor, of course, of Ukraine and Republic of Moldova. But this also definitely shows that the Balkans are in a way second on their list. And not being aware of the huge security challenges that this brings. Because from my point of view, the war is not over in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I've written a book about that. Um, and in these days, with this situation and this feeling of frustration, um, um, a new, not conflict, but a new um, reason for public frustration is not what we actually need to uh, have a more European path for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I think the leaders in Brussels are very aware of that. And they are very real politic about that. They made a choice for closer and more, um, let's say, tangible security interests. Hello, my name is Alexandra, I'm a colleague of Dragos, and I have a question about Bosnia and Herzegovina in the regional context. So, uh, one day prior to the European Council, Viktor Orban uh, <laughs> reached out and declared that uh, Hungary will support the candidacy of uh, Moldova and Ukraine only if, at the same time, the uh, European Council will give the same status to Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia. So my question is, uh, what would be the, the interest of Hungary in this, uh, and why in association with Georgia and not with another Balkan, Balkan country, it is uh, widely known the interest of Viktor Orban or Hungary uh, in, in the Balkans, the relation with, uh, with Serbia and, uh, and so on, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, how do you see uh, the, this uh, move from, uh, from Victor Orban. Thank you.
you must recall the exact um, exact function of the person within his office who tweeted uh, months ago how Bosnia should not be um, should not uh, be a part of EU because it has too many Muslims. Um, and then he's uh, he's a, he's interesting person in terms of his closeness with uh, Serbia's president Vucic and and the leader uh, Milorad Dodik from Republika Srpska. So he is very close to them. Uh, however, uh, I have to say that uh, looking into media and his um, his, um, uh, his his statements, in, in public statements, once the uh, once Russia invaded the Ukraine, he has changed a bit, and in saying that is he is like m more pro Western Balkans within the European within the European Union. Um, but that's, that's all I can say. As I said, it's quite, quite interesting in terms of his attitude towards. Um, and about the interest, he, his obvious interest is Serbia and Republika Srpska. I mean, Victor Orban is just a major annoyance in the European Union. I can say this publicly. And probably his interest is to spoil um, any capacity, to spoil the process, to spoil any capacity. On. And if you ask me once again, I, it's time that unanimity stops in, in most of these sectors. No, because that's the only way to deal. So either we really have a high rule of law pressure and pressurize Poland and Hungary into the direction of adhering to the rule of law, and, and that clearly means some changes, or we let them have their way, but then we need to sort of get them out of the EU decision making because we enable a semi autocracy. Because there are clear indicators of democracy being in decline in both these countries to influence the EU strategic decisions. And I think that's a, a major, it's really a major annoyance. And this is sort of what, what worries me in, in that strategy of appeasement that the Commission has. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for your considerations. I would have a question that is particularly uh, relevant to what Dr. Wiesner uh, said, but of course is directed to you all. So uh, you talk uh, about this necessity of the EU to become a more proactive uh, geopolitical and ideological power uh, in this new world uh, order. However, as we all know, in the EU we have uh, this huge problem, uh, which is unanimity. And I would say that the, the precondition uh, for the EU to become more geopolitical uh, uh, and ideological is uh, treaty change. So what uh, Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi uh, um, stated in, in, the in the European Parliament a few, a few weeks ago, we need a sort of pragmatic federalism. So, uh, and we need that not only to become more geopolitical, but also for enlargement towards the Balkans. We have seen Bulgaria blocking uh, the, the, the uh, North Macedonia at the last uh, uh, European Council uh, summit. So, uh, of course, we need both more integration to get rid of unanimity and uh, enlargement, to integrate and enlarge at the same time. However, let's um, imagine that uh, we can't get rid of unanimity. Let's, let's dream for a moment. And, uh, and so we can adopt a, a sort of common geopolitical vision and for the policy uh, in the EU. My question is, how is that going to impact on the perception of threats by public opinion? Because I'm sure you know that both in candidate countries and within the EU, we don't have a sort of, we don't identify threats in the same way. For example, Serbia does not align with Western sanctions or uh, Moldova is generally uh, uh, very much hostile, uh, per perceives the hostility of Russia, but uh, we have in Moldova uh, Transnistria that is very much pro-Russian and a separatist region. But also in member states, we have, for example, uh, the Italian public opinion that is not fully aligned with the government uh, uh, position. The majority of Italians do not, um, uh, do, do not agree with uh, the, the uh, the deployment of weapons in, in Ukraine. And uh, as well, uh, in Bulgaria, uh, Russian propaganda finds uh, fertile ground uh, 
um, to somehow manipulate public opinion. So my question is, if the EU becomes truly uh, a geopolitical actor and has uh, its credibility boosted at the international level because it, it becomes uh, finally a geopolitical actor, how does this credibility uh, can be somehow disrupted from within if we have some um, if we have in some member state or candidate countries uh, we do not have a sort of common perception of what are our threats. Thank you. Thank you. There were several questions there. Uh, we will collect more if there are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's let's begin. Uh, Claudia, you you can. Uh... Oh no, we have. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Did you see that? I will, start, I will start by saying hi, and uh, it was a pleasure to, to listen to uh, all of you. Uh, my name is Alex, I, uh, study, uh, I study political science at our uh, housing university. Um, my, my question may be uh, some kind of general question, but I expect to, to hear some different opinions. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very concerned about uh, what Russia will gain after <clears throat> after this. Uh, uh, what are uh, what are the object objectives of uh, Russia at the end of the war? Uh, despite of being uh, uh, very hard sanctioned by the uh, by the all the international organizations, uh, how they will survive after that? Um, how they will uh, manage to uh, to getting uh, more allies? Because uh, we can see now uh, they, they don't have uh, they don't have uh, many allies on uh, on their uh, on their side, and uh, I, I'm uh, I'm very concerned about uh, how they will survive after that. Uh, how uh, how their economic uh, how their economy will, will still survive after, and what are their objectives on, uh, on long term? Uh, what will they really gain at the end of that? A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we have any answers Thank for you, but uh, we'll try. Uh, more questions? We'll, we'll have them all because we are running out of time, so. <laughs> okay, the last. Chance. All right, last couple of questions. Hi, uh, a question from uh, Polish citizens about also situation of Poland in the European Union because this is what concerns me and my um, my friends in Poland, my family a lot. Is how close are Hungary and Poland to crossing the line be between the democratic and the authoritarian system, and in consequences leaving the, U the European Union? Uh, and do you think that it is a real threat or is it's just a negative but not really possible scenario? and no possibility to maintain peace based on trade. I mean, I come from a city that was built thanks <laughs> of the basis of if goods doesn't cross the borders, soldiers will. So I think that I need a deep approach of what you mentioned what about big in, in Spain. Uh, and maybe big in the north, uh, close to close to Portugal. We are maintained basically thanks by Detroit. So I think that it was a misunderstanding, uh, maybe for me. But what really needs uh, Europe to reconstruct or re reflects about the maintaining of peace thanks to the trade instead of uh, since the last for the last 200 years, uh, years our peace in Europe is based mainly in trade and I think that uh, Russia is there as a 
I let me say um, a secondary effect of being selling uh, guns not only Euro, uh, uh, United States but also Europe through uh, around the world. So maybe basically your line about the, the reconstruction or the rearrange Europe in not not being able to maintain peace thanks to trade, thanks to the economy. Okay, so find the person at the back. Yeah, we, we have to maybe go through the discussion. <laughs> it was about the treaty change. Uh, thank you. Um, I have in fact, two questions. Uh, so, oh, no. <laughs> just in one, short. One, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, the Quartz presentation said that uh, possibly the uh, geopolitical Europe would have to uh, be also a Europe which uh, is part of the multipolar world order or um, somehow promotes even this order. So I was wondering what is the role of. Uh, EU's internal periphery, let's say, or one of its peripheries, uh, Central and Southeastern Europe, what could be the role of this region um, in that endeavor if the world global south is to be engaged by Europe?
very important, and this is what, what democracy is for. And, and let me put one question now, because one thing that really irritates me in this Ukraine debate is that there is such a lot of talk about the Ukrainian nation. So two points. First of all, I don't think there is such a thing as a nation, because there are no objective criteria. A nation is just an imagined community, as Benedict Anderson put it. And second thing, the history of ideas of European integration is a beautiful history, because it's based on the idea to overcome the nation state, precisely because they are an eternal source of war. So I'm decidedly a person that does not, exclamation mark, subscribe to the right of the European <coughs> Ukrainian nation to defend itself. I have a lot of question marks there, let alone the fact that my husband, if I would be living in Ukraine, would not be here with me, but he would have been torn out of a bus at the border, they were forced to fight in war, even if it had been an object of conscience. And, and this is something that is not discussed. And I'm not saying it's not a right of the Ukrainian government to do that, but I would like to have a debate on this. Which brings me to my second and final remark. Um, in, in, the, in the break, we had a debate about the major German art exhibition, a documentary that takes place in the moment, and that has a major anti-Semitism scandal. And I, I think actually it has something to do with what we have. So it, it turns out that after a long debate, an image appears in the major German art exhibition that has clearly anti-Semitic caricatures in it. Which is not a, a simple thing in Germany because of our history. It's a major crime, post it was a, a, a crime against the dignity of the people. Um, and now we have a big scandal because everybody refuses responsibility. Um, so the, the, the director general of the documentary says she is not responsible, the artistic director says they are not responsible, and everybody says, oh, we don't know how this appeared. But after all, it's not really a drama, and the argument that is coming is, this is how people from the global south see certain violences, and so it's all fine, because it comes from the global south. So we really, you know, it's a kind of little detail. For some people, that is an anti-Semitic uh, picture. I, I, I find this shocking it questions our values, um, and I think it's an example of, um, of those internal conflicts in, in the member states um, that we have been mentioning, and it's also a, a sign of how something switches in Germany um, towards, also because it comes at the same time that those very people that think it's a detail to have an anti-Semitic caricature want to send weapons to Ukraine. So to me, there is, I'm, I'm sensing something that sort of frightens me a bit in this, and that doesn't really fit with all of this um, uh, that we have been discussing. So I think, actually, the, the point that you were making about memory, I, I think it's really crucial for, for, for you both. So that we, we, we are based on this history of the Second World War, and that's not an emotional argument, but it's an argument about millions that have been dead, and this is linked to the Holocaust, and the Holocaust is a kind of founding narrative also, and the never again to of the European Union. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think that this also raises a lot of not so easy to answer questions, and a lot of internal responsibilities also in Europe. Which brings me at the last point, um, I'm really very decidedly against this impression of the global south, because I don't think there is such a thing as a global south. There are countries that are economically and politically dependent. Some are in the south of the world, some are in the north of the world. And to me, it's just a simplifying and also belittling expression to speak of the global south. And this is sort of why I really would make an appeal in favor of the multipolar or, or multi-order world um, that I have been making. And in this, I think Europe really needs to have a debate on, on, on the responsibilities, on the principles, on, on the problems, also on the dilemmata, because what, what I try to do is to mention a lot of these dilemmata. I, I will pick two questions because it would be difficult to, to address all of them. So one of Vladimir about uh, Global South and the role of uh, EU's internal periphery. I guess you definitely would uh, include Romania and Bulgaria in this. Um, and that was also the, one of the major points of, of our uh, panel today. Uh, so definitely um, Romania and Bulgaria uh, have um, defined their geopolitical identity in the Black Sea. 
specifically towards uh, the to strengthen the transatlantic partnership and, and their special relation with the United States, but at the same time uh, positioning themselves strongly uh, in uh, in NATO overall. And we have the B9 format, Bucharest 9 uh, format, where that was proposed by Poland and um, uh, Romania uh, in 2015 already. Uh, you have the three C's initiatives. There are multiple regional cooperation uh, formats at the Black Sea, where you could see the need for regional um, uh, leadership. Now, definitely, I think uh, Western powers need to accept that the Baltic countries, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, are the countries that. Uh, not only uh, pretend to know how Russia thinks, uh, but uh, they actually uh, do. Uh, not only because of historical experience, but also of their great uh, diplomatic potential and maybe I, we could say also uh, high performance intelligence. Uh, we should underline the huge role that these countries have in, in the past uh, in the past months uh, in helping the Western uh, chancelleries redefine their um, their view on what actually uh, Russia is capable of, uh, definitely together with the U.S. support. So I think that we are now witnessing uh, something that was just in the air, and that is. Uh, the eastern flank of NATO uh, becoming a driving force for European security, unfortunately in a situation of war becoming a real pragmatic project that we can definitely sense, right? So we have new, more troops, we have military capabilities coming uh, to, to Romania and uh, this is, I guess, uh, both a good news and a bad news. So uh, this is the moment when, um, uh, unfortunately, definitely the situation now in Bulgaria is not uh, confirming that due to the, the huge crisis, but uh, these countries are now trying to show that after 15 years of membership, uh, they have the right to speak uh, and to determine um, EU decisions in terms of security and foreign policy at the highest uh, level. And I would say that um, uh, we have to be careful how we judge these 15 years. Is it a lot? Is it um, actually too late, maybe? Uh, for some frustrations to uh, to keep piling up in the case of Hungary uh, more and less uh, Poland. That is a question. And uh, coming back to the question of what is the purpose and the gain of Russia, I think I mean, this is such an important question. It would be difficult. Uh, maybe we will try to, to discuss about it uh, many days from now. Uh, but for me, one of the greatest gains that is already unfortunately visible is um, suing division inside European Union and inside suing uh, lack of trust in uh, the NATO alliance. I mean, it's not just about Turkey. There are many other uh, NATO members that are uh, still, uh, you know, not on the same page on how NATO should uh, react in this conflict. And suing division is exactly what we are saying is something that European Union doesn't need. Not only because it has its own institutional and structural problems in terms of security and foreign policy, but also because this brings us back to nation states. This is the Cold War rhetoric. Let's not forget who are the strategists in Kremlin. They are all Cold War cronies. Unfortunately, they met also some Cold War cronies in Pentagon. And these um, generation, Cold War, uh, let's say generation, are now reviving what they have been educated to feel. And that is very narrow national interest, very pragmatic and cynical perspective of who is the best in the schoolyard, right? I'm not trying to oversimplify and maybe be a, too sarcastic, but I have this feeling that uh, we are watching a Cold War movie all over again, uh, and we are accepting um, um, Russian Federation to take us back to this very narrow uh, and, uh, nation state uh, discussion. A nation state discussion that is actually totally the opposite of what the European Union is all about. Uh, the European Union is not uh, uh, about intergovernmentalism only, it's also about the cooperation between the supranational and the intergovernmental. So, European Union should not be taken back to the nation state discourse. And unfortunately, I would say one of the results is this. But the hope is we will have the, let's say, institutional intelligence not to be drawn back in this Cold War story again. I'll just make two more uh, points 
but continuing the discussion. Uh, we are not only watching the, the Cold, War, uh, Cold War movie, but we are watching a classical Hollywood blockbuster, US against uh, Russia. Um, economically, you asked how Russians are surviving. They have spent entire foreign reserves. Uh, all the banks are basically uh, removed from the Swiss system. Multinational companies have left the country. We have read on a daily basis, food, uh, clothing, everything. But uh, we don't know, actually, because media is not saying. We cannot see how the Russians are living. We know previously that it is, has been a society of big inequalities high poverty, highly equal society. So we can assume that these gaps are just widening and uh, that we still have, <laughs> obviously, the, the, the Russian elites, uh, the, the ones that are still quite rich and being able to enjoy all the, 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 the powers that they have and the money that they have, even though the, some, some of them have been uh, on, on sanctions. And the, the comment about regional trade and cooperation, how actually international trade is important, yes, it is. This is, this is the story of the beginning of the European Union, European steel and coal community, putting all these six countries together to trade and so on. But let's not remember, forget that Washington consensus, the, the set of reforms was, in the basis, it had one size fits all. Okay, we have these ten liberalized trade, liberalized financial markets, decentralized, uh, uh, privatized, and, and so on, and this, this, this is the, the prescribed list for every single country. It was, and it has been shown as a, unsuccessful, obviously. There, there, there were countries that in the Central Europe, Eastern Europe that were quite successful with the reforms, and some that have not. So we are only asking that, uh, and saying that, okay, regional cooperation, international trade is important, SEFTA was created, of 90s just to prepare as a waiting room for the, for the Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, uh, and other countries. But um, it is just the beginning. It, and maybe we now, as the Western Balkans and other countries that are on the list as a potential or candidate countries, we maybe now need another recipe, not only focusing on international trade and the regional cooperation for something something more, including go, and going back to the rule of law and, and corruption, that it's obviously prerequisite for everything. Market economy, more foreign direct investment, and so on. Thank you very much for the speakers, and thank you very much for the audience, for the wonderful questions. Uh, it has been a very rich discussion, and we will surely uh, continue this uh, over drinks. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>